Well, I have to start the same way as I had it written down that I received my calling to be a missionary when I was 17. And actually, the first time I met a missionary was from YWAM. To tell you the truth, I don't really remember much about him. And actually, when I met him, he was really downright boring. <laughs> it was just the Holy Spirit opened my heart to the missionary vocation. And I prayed about it, and my prayers led me to act. And when I was 23, I walked into the streets of Sao Paulo, Brazil for the first time, and I'm from Singapore. Now Singapore and Brazil have nothing in common. <laughs> and God brought me to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I felt at home. And the first thing I noticed when I went to the red light district of Sao Paulo, there were about four to five hundred street children, homeless children, in a, in a square in front of a cathedral. And all these children were either using crack or sniffing glue. And the point, the turning point of my ministry there was when I saw a six-year-old boy with a crack pipe, smoking crack. And at that moment, I just said, we have to stop doing what we're doing and we have to start looking. We're not doing what, whatever we we're doing at that point wasn't effective. And so we started to pray. And then God should open our eyes to see that He loved His children passionately. Jesus loves them passionately. And then He opened our eyes to see what Jesus was doing in the red light district. And we noticed the kids, when they came, they, read, they left their homes. All of them are in the streets because the streets, the red light district is safer than their homes. And most of them cannot go home, and they should not go home, because they, they, they will die. So the, the red light district, the, all the kids go to the red light district, and they form little family units. And I, we noticed, the missionaries noticed, that these children were hungry for a family. And our family units, they form were all based on drugs. They were older kids. They call them that mom and dad, and the younger kids, they all worked together and got cracked and used them together. And so we went out and became a family of Jesus. We, we sat there, we played with the kids, we talked with them, and then they realized after a couple of years that this family is a different family. And this is a family that's going to teach us to have abundant life. So we worked there for about six years. And I had some problems with that. The, the, the problem that we face is, it's not enough for us to go there and say, Jesus is our, your hope. We have to live that hope out. We have to be the physical manifestation of that hope. We cannot just say, Jesus love, wants to adopt you. We have to adopt them into our families. And so right now, at that time when I was there, we had to, we were we came to a standstill. We needed the church to be behind us to continue this work. And it took me about a good ten years looking for a church that would be interested in investing because these children need to know that there is hope in Jesus Christ and they need to see that hope manifested in their lives. Now, a story I'd like to say, I'll share with you is about this boy called Emerson. Now, Emerson went to the streets when he was eight years old. His mother died when he was eight. And his father was a wanted criminal. His father committed homicide, several multiple homicide. And Emerson was in the streets because he had lost all hope. And one day, he came up, we were, I had a long-standing relationship with Emerson, and Emerson asked me this question. He said, what, do you think, what makes you think that there's hope for me? He said, I have no hope. The whole of society thinks I have no hope, and they are right. And nobody believes that I can change. And really, at that moment, Emerson was waiting for a God's evangelical answer. And at that moment, I just told him, listen, Emerson, I'm from Singapore. My wife's from Maine. <laughs> and we are here to 
tell you that God loves you and He hopes for you. God's not sparing ex any expenses to show Emerson that there is hope in Jesus Christ. And so now, we are going back. We want to start a religious community there. We want to start a community of missionaries. And we want to build this community up so that pe people like Emerson can find hope in a family. Now this is going to be a long-term project. It's not going to be, it's not going to happen in a couple of years. And it's a, a project we, we hope that I can go there and say, Emerson, or this time, there's a bigger church behind you. And I hope I can say that this church is the Diocese of Central Florida. Thank you. I've been to the kinds of communities that he has described, only they are in Manila, Philippines, and other parts of the world like that, where the safest place for children is not with their nuclear family. It really is on the street. When he said, if I go home, I will die, he was not being metaphorical. He was literal. And he also said, I hope you heard quite clearly, that the only answer is for Christians to, in, in essence, provide a new family environment, a change from the drug families that they know in the streets, which is why what Stephen and Mary are undertaking is, by its very nature, a long-term project. There is both a kind of withdrawal and a rebuilding that will take years for the lives of many, many of these children. When Stephen and Mary told me the story, his involvement with Youth with a Mission, which is part of what brought him there originally, God did something in my heart, and I knew that his place was not Coventry or Cala. It really was back in San Paulo. And so we are commissioning Stephen and Mary as missionaries from this diocese. We are their home sponsoring church. And to that end, we set him free as quickly as possible from his obligations at Coventry so that he could travel from church to church to specifically solicit financial and prayerful support. Um, your dance card is actually pretty full, from what I understand. And, um, but if you want to know more, and if you'd like to be a real partner in mission with Stephen and Mary, I would encourage you to make the time to get in touch with them. You will see their names in the cycle of prayer. I anticipate email, right, emails regularly from them so that we know how to pray for them and their ongoing work. Uh, we are, in essence, investing through Stephen and Mary in the gospel project that will be in the Red Light District of St. Paulo. He goes with my blessing as a bishop. He's already in contact with the Episcopal clergy in St. Paulo, Brazil. And so he is going, knowing that he is coming under our authority and blessing. And so it's all kosher in terms of how all that stuff works. And uh, because I don't want to do anything to hinder the work that, and the call that God has had on Stephen and Mary's life. So this is not just a sort of one minute blurb and so now let's go do something else. Uh, we have things to undertake, but I wanted us to pause and understand in the what we, in the book we are being invited. Do you understand? So I would urge you to make the time to think about your own resources, whether it be you adopt Stephen and Mary through the missionary line item of your church, or through some kind of regular contribution through the clergy, or a group in your church that says, we want to be a part of that, and we're going to help do it, whether that's the ECW or the Daughters of the Youth Group. Uh, there are lots of possibilities, but I would encourage you, um, we're who he's got right now. Lord, we do thank you for Stephen and for Mary. We're sorry that Mary cannot be with us because she's attending to illness in her family. But we do pray that you would pour on both of them your mercy, your abundance, and your provision. Thank you, O oh God, for breaking our hearts for these children. Continue to pour through their broken hearts your power, your compassion, and your life. We bless them, and we thank you for for it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.